John, wouldn't you say that what we're dependent on, we call reality, and what we don't like, we consider an intrusion in our life? Consequently, I feel that what's happening is that we're continually being intruded upon. That would make us very unhappy. Hmm? Or we surrender to it and call it culture. Call it culture. Or whatever. Give me an example. What, what, what would be an intrusion on your life, for instance, that you would call culture? Well, uh, this weekend I was, uh, I was on the beach. Yes. And on the beach these days are uh, transistor radios. Yes. Blaring out rock and roll. Yes. All over. Yes. And you didn't enjoy it? Not particularly. I adjusted to it. How? By saying that, well, I, I thought of the sun and the sea as a lesser evil. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you know how I did, adjusted to that problem of the radio in the environment. Very much as the uh, primitive people adjusted to the animals which frightened them and which probably as you say were intrusions they made drew pictures of them hmm? on their caves and so i simply made a piece using radios now whenever i hear radios even a single one not just 12 at a time as you must have heard on the beach at least i think well they're just playing my piece <laughs> <laughs> That might help me next weekend. Yeah, and I listen to it with pleasure. Uh, by, by pleasure, I mean uh, I notice what happens. I can attend to it rather than, um, as you say, surrender. I can rather pay attention and become interested in the... Um, well, what it, what it actually is that you're interested in is what superimposes what. What happens at the same time, together with what happens before and what happens after. Yes, but I can't think unless thought is something of the past. Uh, the other night I met some friends in a place which I was very nostalgic about. I used to go there and talk a lot. No one could hear each other. Because of this? Because of this. Yeah. Well, uh, this, this brings up the remark of Satie's that uh, what we need is a music which will um, not interrupt the noises of the environment. Hmm? In other words, we might then need thoughts uh, which would not uh, impose upon the transistorized <laughs> radios. <laughs> All I'm trying to say is that this is a coin which has two sides and that the, um, say you think of your thoughts as the reality, or your conversation at least, that you wish to have as a reality and the environment is an in intrusion, then that sati remark just takes that coin, turns it over and says the reality is the environment, what you want to do in it is an intrusion. And finally, the work of an artist, for instance, is it not an, an incisive intrusion? Hmm? Because for heaven's sake, it didn't exist until the artist does it. Hmm? Yes, I never heard anybody really boo a transistor radio. <laughs> I think, well, you have just now, in a sense, and I, uh, I have done it. 
formerly, when I would go into any friend's home um, out of deference, you know, to my tastes, uh, seeing me coming, they simply turned off all the, um, any radio that was, or even a disc that happened to be playing at the time. Now they no longer do it. They know that I think that I composed all those things. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's a problem for me. I feel that I'm quite at odds with it. Well, maybe I like... Maybe actually I really like things to... Uh, for example, if I'm standing in front of a jet and I hear the blaring sound, I don't feel annoyed because I know it's going to take me someplace. Yeah. Or mm -hmm. that it's bringing some friends. The noise is utilitarian. <laughs> <coughs> and it almost dramatizes the flight, you know. Yeah. But, but that then is not an intrusion, really. That's a, that's a sound which, because of other things you're doing, you must um, carry along, as it were, with you, with your experience at any rate. What would you say to giving a concert of your works in an architectural situation where something else that was going on was um, at least partly audible at the same time. Let's imagine, just to make the conversation consistent, that the um, um, concert is in a room and that one door from that room is open, and in the room upon which it opens, uh, radio music is audible. Now, must that door be closed, or may it be left open? I would like the door to be left open, but without the radio. <laughs> you see, I want to leave the door open, but of course. Well, all we have to do to know that that in that room, if the door is open, all we have to do to know that there is something in that room that that if we are exercising our um, choices, we will know that in that room is something we don't desire if if we are living with our desires or our choices and the only only thing that the simplest thing you can do to find out that that's the case is simply to pick up a newspaper because the things that are happening are not things that you would have chosen in your right mind to have happen in the world in that room now years ago the radio was blaring. I think that there was just uh, as many intrusions as there are today, but I didn't hear them. Today I hear them. So there must be something there that seems to be competing with me. Or let's put it this way, that my old role has been uh, weakened psychologically. Well, what was your role? The old-fashioned role of the artist, deep in thought. Well, this is certainly changing, I think. And... Um, Since, since it's perfectly clear that you're a magnificent artist in that role of being deep in thought, hmm, what I would like to see is how magnificent you are intruded upon. What do you think of that idea? Do you recall, I, isn't this true that once when we had one of those conversations we so... Um, I'm sure each of us so remembers walking through the streets of Lower East Side and the village and whatnot 
until late hours at night. Um, I think I expressed once the idea that that you had discovered a, a world, a musical world, because it was your music really that opened up uh, everything, your piece, the, uh, uh, what was it called, the one for, I think the first one was for piano. Projection. Projection, yes, mm. and, and you wrote it uh, down at Monroe Street and David Tudor and I were in the other room, and you left us, and you wrote this piece on graph, giving us this um, freedom of playing in those three ranges, high, middle, and low. And um, then we went in and played the piece, and it was then that the, the musical world changed. Now, not just the musical world outside of you, but the musical world inside of you, hmm? in this role that you speak of, deep in thought. Nevertheless, the thing I think I said to you once on that walk through the night is now that you have opened up this world, let us see all the things that are in it. Now, among the things that are in that world is this a situation of granted someone deep in thought his being intruded upon. Yes, but that's become the image. Hmm? That's become the image. No, there are many images now, I would say. I think there are... I don't think we can count them any longer. I mean, for myself. I mean, it's become very the predominant one yeah. of someone who is thinking and always interrupted. Mm. Yes. And this thinking. Yes. Which, uh, of course, is a, always a marvelous thing because you begin to see that what you're thinking about isn't that important to begin with. Yes. I always found there's something a little too pretentious about thought to begin with. Also, there's... Also, any given thought has an enormous um, potential. It's a, it, it gets into our heads and won't go out for years and years and years. At the same time, I mean, just uh, simply <laughs> stated, I can't conceive of some brat turning on a transistor radio in my face and say, ah, the environment. But all that radio is, uh, Marty, is uh, making available to your ears what was already in the air and uh, approach and available to your ears, but you couldn't hear it. In other words, all it is is making audible something that you're already in. You are bathed in radio waves, TV broadcasts, probably telepathic messages hmm? from other minds deep in thought. <laughs> <laughs> Listening to the radio at the same time. <laughs> and this radio simply makes audible something that, that you thought was inaudible. Now, you know, most painters I know, they all listen to music when they work. You know, Franz Klein loved Wagner. He yeah, used to listen to and, Wagner. Uh, David Tudor, when he practices, uh, which he does so rarely now, but when any time he does practice, he immediately turns on not one, but several radios, and often a TV <laughs> set at the same time. Uh, you might compare it with the tantric Buddhist uh, discipline. You know, the, you know of those disciplines? No to meditate while sitting on a corpse or in the course of sexual intercourse. In other words, to make the, the situation in which you're deep in thought a really difficult one in which to be in thought. Hmm? Now, what happens there? There, there is obviously an intrusion uh, against which the... Um, 
at least we imagine, the uh, person in meditation steals himself. Hmm? Now, does he or doesn't he? We won't know, because what would enlightenment be in that case? Would it be being blind to your environment, or would it be um, being quite aware of it and at the same time deep in thought? Hmm? Yes. I know what's happening, though. I know what's happening for myself, where 15 years ago, with a perspective of the sound in the piece, even though it did try, and I did try, to embrace that which would cast a shadow on my work. Many of my pieces I wrote almost Actually, I remember once I even wrote a piece just trying to capture the post saving of the tires going in the rain on the drive. But it was all still distant. It was on the outer edges, so to speak, of the piece. And now what is happening is that the focus is different. I find myself right on top of all the things which uh, in the past I found Unesthetical. Now, I still find it unesthetical, but I'm on top of it. So a journey was made. I certainly don't want to then make the leap, wherever this leap will be, into a situation where, uh, not unlike uh, a car ride I was in with Larry Rivers and we passed a garbage dump. And he says, you know, uh, a little grapefruit on the left would just give it a nice color. Yeah. I've had similar drives through the country on our tours with Bob Rauschenberg, where he'd see the sunset or something and criticize it, you know, and <laughs> suggest that the colors be different and the trees in different positions. But that, it, like humor, hmm? What was it with Larry? Was it humor or was it... Um... Well, with Larry, I think Larry was worried. That this color was absent, you mean? No, not that the color was absent, but uh, he was uh, he wasn't raving against um, junk sculpture or um, a garbage collage. But uh, he was afraid that if he himself made the leap, is that he'll start to see this new thing in the kind of some type of an, uh, an aesthetic judgment. Yeah. Almost juxtapose a, 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 a an observation he would make about Cezanne, yeah. and juxtapose it in relation to a garbage heap, you know. Yeah. You remember that one of those concerts at Town Hall that we around the late forties, the early fifties, uh, when the painters were still going to the concerts, and, mm -hmm. and when we spoke of the Renaissance of new music and so forth, Varese was beginning to be played again. Um, I got, after the concert, I got in the blue ribbon at a table where Bill de Kooning was. And I don't think I heard all of the conversation, but it was clear that they were talking about the way the crumbs had fallen on the, on the tablecloth. And Bill was discussing whether or not this was art. Hmm? And he was uh, concluding, of course, that it wasn't. Hmm? But then that was, um, a difference that had already appeared between myself and Bill. I remember his saying once to me, um, difference between us is that I want to be a great artist and you don't. Was he wrong? No, I think he's absolutely right. <laughs> you mean if you want to be a great artist, you have to turn off the radio? Or well, you well, feel that's no, part of it? No, no. I, th I don't know any longer um, what... Uh, I really don't know what being an artist is. I think that the... Uh, 
I have difficulty with the notion of roles. In other words, I don't want to play a role. I want to be, um, be so to speak, uh, what I am. I, uh, if I am playing a role, I want to play it all the time. If I'm not playing a role, I don't want to play a role. Hmm? But what it was to be a composer doesn't seem to me any longer to be what it is now to be a composer, and I don't know what it is to be a composer now. Unless... I don't even know what it was to be a composer. Well, you said earlier, and I'm agreeing with you, and I, I remember doing it, it was being deep in thought. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's, that's, that's all I'm left with. I feel if this thought yeah. was taken away from me, yeah. that's it. Yeah. No, but there could be another way to be a composer, surely. There could at least be uh, this one we've already mentioned, someone deep in thought who is constantly interrupted. Hmm? Or, like there, or there could be what I've suggested, I think, in my some of my work, um, someone who um, doesn't have any thoughts and so uh, is uh, can't be said to be either shallow or deep, hmm? and who simply uh, sets something going that... Uh, either has sounds in it or doesn't have sounds in it that enables uh, uh, not only other people but himself too to um, uh, experience. I guess in my case that it goes out of thought into um, experience. This was certainly um, one of the things that showed up when the, when the uh, Frenchman headed by Boulez began to object to my work and ideas, they objected to the notion that music was made of sound. Yes, I always thought that was extraordinary. It was like the medical profession objecting to the fact that some of us said that they should wash their hands when they perform an operation. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think, I think one of the things that has happened is that it's become clear that we, we can be not just with our minds, but with our whole being um, responsive to sound. And that that sound doesn't have to be uh, the communication of, of uh, some deep thought. It can be just a sound. Now, that sound could go in one ear and out the other. Or it could go in one ear, uh, permeate the being, hmm? <laughs> transform the being, and then perhaps go out, letting the next one in. <laughs> <laughs> and then whether or not an idea developed. You know, the hardest thing in the world, of course, is to have a head without any ideas in it. But that's always the best work, you know? Always was. Yeah. That's perhaps what you mean by deep in thought. Oh, no, no. Uh, many times, I mean, my, if I'm in deep in thought, it's just to get rid of the ideas. Exactly, exactly. To get to the point where the... To get to that, I don't know what you would call it. You might get, call it an ocean. Hmm? To get to that... Uh, For me, it almost, it becomes almost like a, a physical stamina yeah. to just go on with an empty head. That, that, yeah. That's what I mean by being it, deep it, in thought. It, yeah, if it's like an ocean with fish in it, and the fish are thoughts, that you've gotten to the point where the, the view is so uh, full of the ocean that you don't um, notice the fish, hmm? Yes, it sounds like my new piece. <laughs> but maybe I don't want the ripples to come in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But does it matter? You mean the ripples? Or what do you mean? We expect them. Well, as a matter of fact, we couldn't live without them. Hmm? Back to impermanence. Or the ocean couldn't live without them. Hmm? 
Motion wouldn't be ocean without them. I'm just reading um, uh, a thing I got in the mail from a behavioral psychologist at La Jolla in California, Richard Farson. And he said, um, he says near the beginning of it, that um, we used to um, settle down, say, in some change that we made. And there would be a period uh, when we could, so to speak, adjust to this change. But that it, it becomes evident that we are going to be living in, um, in a situation which is, so to speak, change itself. He has all, one very interesting remark in that article, too, to support his thought. Something like 90% of the scientists who ever lived on this globe are now living. Isn't that interesting? You mean that there was such an influx of scientists? This is what we're living in, is a period um, in which uh, changes brought about by this activity of research and technology and so forth is producing, um, well, those transistorized radios, etc. Hmm? Oh, then one almost could say that 90% of the artists are no longer living. Of those deep in thought, probably. Yes. You know, I had certainly this feeling when I, I was asked by the Kenyan Review to re review the Schoenberg letters, you know. I don't know if you read them. Yes, I read them, Jim. But reading that book, um, and I, I um, worshipped Schoenberg, and reading the book brought back that feeling of awe and so forth. He, he appears in his writings and in his mind and everything to, to be... Um, I tried to think of anyone else like him now. Hmm? And um, there is, I couldn't. The, the the closest I could come to it, say, was Stefan Volpe. Hmm? Uh, there's a little bit of it, but quite different in, in Karl-Heinz Stockhausen. Hmm? Uh, then again, outside the field of music, in painting, uh, the question arose recently of, of re-establishing Black Mountain College. And it was clear to anyone who knew Black Mountain that, that it depended upon the personality of Joseph Albers and he's no longer available for such a post, well, who could take his place, hmm? And uh, you just don't know of anyone like that. They don't, uh, as you say, they don't live anymore. <laughs> what happened? Another question um, um, we could ask is, when did it happen, hmm? And, and we don't really know the answers to any of these questions. We'd say, well, maybe it happened toward the late end of the 50s, or maybe it happened in the <laughs> 60s. <laughs> and furthermore, there was a difference, an essential difference between um, uh, Schoenberg and Joseph Albers already. I would say from those letters and from my experience of Schoenberg that he was, uh, Black Mountain would not have been Black Mountain under his direction because Albers already introduced into the um, life of Black Mountain College an enormous amount of permissiveness. But he was able, on occasion, to draw that whole thing together into a kind of a German image where everyone would click his heels and stand at attention and took him seriously. Hmm? And then when he unclicked his heels, they all went back to not attending their classes and, and doing whatever rendered their minds, graduating or not graduating. Schoenberg would never have, have permitted that kind of situation. Yet, Black Mountain was a glorious situation, so much so that one would like to revive it. And one doubts whether one would want to revive Schoenberg's own image of a school you know, in his letters toward the end, they wanted him to establish a school in Israel. Yes. And he spoke of it as um, 
the graduates from this school would be priests. Hmm? <laughs> and it was it was it would have been a, a quasi religious situation with no one smiling ever. How can you smile if you're deep in thought? <laughs> But what's the need for Black Mountain when this whole permissiveness seems to be like one vast Black Mountain? Well, it must be that what they want in reestablishing Black Mountain is the discipline side of it, hmm? the clicking of the heels part of it. <laughs> you mean this uh, permissiveness is not getting anywhere? <laughs> not that, but uh, people have not found out how to um, assume this permissiveness as a, you know, as a responsibility. Or they would like that, something like that, I think, to happen. Maybe I'm wrong. Unfortunately, with permissiveness, there usually comes a very quick type of boredom. Boredom is not so bad. And not really boring, you know. This is something I've known all along from Zen Buddhism. You know that story. Uh, if something's boring after two minutes, try it yes. for four. After four, try it for eight, etc. You eventually find it isn't boring. People are constantly complaining. Almost every day somebody tells me that, that um, things are boring. Uh, things aren't boring. Our music isn't boring. Uh, it's just that... Uh, the um, people manage somehow not with these things that they say are boring not to get with them once they get with them then uh, boredom's the last thing that enters their minds however even while it's boring I would say that it's um, um, something to be uh, valued and experienced haven't you noticed that when your work gets really boring, as when um, you're copying out something that you uh, mm -hmm. d had written, you know, it's at that moment that ideas begin to fly into your head. When you're really um, bored, it, it, it brings you uh, closer and closer to the actual experience of, say, that ocean we were talking about in which some other fish than you had ever encountered might suddenly appear, hmm? And eat up all the other fish. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but then, who can speak of boredom nowadays, really? Who has his eyes or ears in the least little bit open? The only one who can speak of boredom is the one who, who isn't really paying attention to, to what's happening. I found recently that uh, any old newspaper lying around was um, on page after page um, having ideas which were pertinent, relevant to the ones that I was having. And so of, of um, quite outside the, uh, you know, the realm of, of being boring, they were so to speak, um, uh, reinforcing um, like they're doing now up in the sky um, with that um, Gemini and what do they call it, Aegina and so on, mm -hmm. giving further um, power, you know, to go to greater heights. And this power comes now from almost anything around us, I think. Would you teach music? I mean, if someone came to you and asked to study. Well, just as I... You see, if I have problems now, they're, first of all, problems about how to continue my work as I travel around. We talked about that. Yes. Now, say I solved that problem and could carry my work with me and, and do it in odd moments. If I had a student, formerly, I would have said that the first obligation of the teacher is to be present when the student is present. Hmm? 
Now, if I'm going to be traveling around, uh, I certainly don't want all those students traveling around with me. <laughs> and so I don't feel really in a position of teaching unless I'm with them. Now, this may mean that our notion of, of what it is to be with people has to change. Hmm? It may be that we can be with people, but at the same time at a distance. No, I think we could... Uh, uh. Yes, that was always very interesting. One never considered years ago having students as an intrusion. I remember... Well, Schoenberg was incessantly teaching. Yes. It appeared that he preferred it to composition. Hmm? Almost. He was extraordinarily generous with his uh, time, ideas, and, and this teach this faculty that he had, which is grand for for teaching, combined with terror and Fuller. Uh, Buckminster Fuller says that, and so does McLuhan. I think that in. Um, and now Farson, this one I mentioned, um, says that the whole business of the, of the society we're moving into is going to be education. They all seem to agree that the least important element in that educational life will be the teacher. If the teacher has anything to say, he will say it on some kind of recording device with images and so forth, TV. If anyone ever wants to hear it, they'll simply push a button and hear it. He will not be in the position, as teachers formerly were, of having to repeat himself, hmm? Year after year. <laughs> he will simply do it once, and then he himself will become a student, hmm? Along with the other students, and try to discover what it is that uh, his mind, his interests, and so forth can do rather than just repeating. And you'd be astonished going around the country uh, seeing how much TV has already entered into the, you know, the educational um, business. It's, it's certainly true that if education is what we will do, it's going to be, have to be far more interesting than it has been. It would have to be well, I don't know what it would have to be. It would have to give a great deal more um, confidence to the students themselves to do um, their own work. Well, I don't think that'll ever be adapted in the music department. Well, I think they're going to change. You know, there was a terrifying story. We were at a famous school, and at a famous seminar, graduate seminar, a young composer brought this piece in, and um, his teacher, a world-renowned composer, uh, told him to change it. And the student said, who wasn't really a student, he was a young composer, said, but I hear it this way. And his teacher said, you are here to change your hearing. Mm. Who, who was, uh, did you say who that was? No, I didn't. You didn't. It's very curious. Uh, it could, you know, if I knew the circumstances, I'd know whether I went on one side or the other. I'd say whether I agreed with the teacher. Certainly one doesn't want a fixed way of hearing. either the one or the other. I'd like to have my ears so I could hear what there was to hear. <laughs>